Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. On today's show, the explosive book of former FBI Director James Comey and the legal battles facing President Trump with attorney Joseph Malouf. Joseph Malouf, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Jorge. Um, Joseph, uh, since the launch of the book of James Comey, the former FBI Director, a higher loyalty, truth, lies, and leadership, what has happened? A lot has happened. Uh, there has been a lot of looking into the details of the book, into the story that James Comey wanted to tell, you know, who was the star of the whole thing. James Comey is a reputable person, someone with an amazing background in uh, service to his country, uh, in, in volunteering, uh, in someone with integrity. Uh, the president can't say that about himself, and I think this book is indirectly uh, making you judge Trump and the way he talks and what he says and what he does and someone like James Comey. And if I were in a court of law, having James Comey as a witness against the president, I would, you know, guess here, but I think that uh, James Comey would be believed and the president would not. Well, precisely, ABC News was doing a poll about that, and the American public says that they believe much more James Comey than President Trump, and the difference is more than 20 points. Well, in the, in the difference is, is we're talking about not a simple lie, uh, but we're talking about significant events, including the firing of James Comey that he describes in detail. He describes having a 10-year term to serve. <coughs> he served with a Republican president, a Democratic president, and had no anticipation that he would be fired. And he wasn't fired right away. It wasn't something President Trump did when he took over. Uh, what he did, and I think that's what the book talks about in detail, is he uh, felt attempts by President Trump uh, of obstruction, obstructive attempts, things that would not be told to, uh, to the authorities, as if James Comey wasn't a member of the FBI, which obviously, as the director of the FBI, he is the top police officer. And you don't tell a police officer or you don't make suggestions that they drop the investigation of a friend because they're good guys. And that's what I think the book also tells. Among the many things that uh, James Comey mentions in, in his book, he says Donald Trump is morally unfit to be president, and he compares him with a mob, a mob boss. I, um, I think I understood uh, after I read the book why he said that. I think it's because he was trained in investigating the mafia in New York. I mean, he was doing that with, you know, and he worked for Rudy Giuliani, um, and so he was familiar with how the mafia operates uh, and worked very closely with other investigators who were infiltrating the mafia. And the method of work is not a method where you have a democratic way of getting an answer. In, in the U.S., we have a democracy, and a democracy requires that power be shared by three different independent bodies of government. The judicial, which is the Supreme Court that decides whether things are illegal, the legislative, the Congress, and then the executive, the White House. And inside the executive branch, you have the FBI and the Department of Justice. And even though they're part of the department, the president has never understood that they are not under his direct supervision. They're only under the supervision of the Secretary of Justice, the Attorney General, and the FBI is with the director of the FBI. And they're supposed to be independent of the president, which is something that when you read in the book about the mafia and how the mafia operates, there's only one boss. And the boss tells the lieutenants what to do. And the lieutenants tell their people what to do. And nobody can complain. And there's no, no one else's opinion involved. But that's not what we have here. The incident comes when uh, the former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn is on its way to be at least proven that has had contacts with the Russians, Correct. Uh, supposedly a collusion in order to favor President Trump, at that point, candidate Trump campaign. And uh, in, uh, in a meeting at the Oval Office, at that point, President Trump is asking his Vice President Mike Pence and the Minister of Justice for Latin America, the Secretary of Justice, Jeff Sessions, to get out. Correct. And he stays one-on-one -on -one with Comey 
and ask him, or he doesn't ask him, it has just, he suggests him uh, to, to drop the investigation. Well, he, it's interesting. I, it was, it's not telling him and it wasn't really suggesting him. He was talking like a mafia boss. He was saying, it would be nice if you would let go of this. It would be nice if you find it in your heart that this person is a good person. That's not how uh, governments operate. You know, an investigation is dropped because the authorities feel that there's no crime committed. That's the only reason. With a police officer, FBI director, whoever the authority is, if they find that there has been a crime, they cannot drop that crime. They're bound, legally bound, to investigate and prosecute if they find evidence. That's not how the mafia operates. So the president, and I think this is the most important thing about that book, is that when the president asks Comey's boss, which is the Department of Justice minister, which is uh, Jeff Sessions, and everyone else, Mike Pence, Ryan Spribas, uh, to leave the room, it, it, it fulfills the requirement for obstruction of justice in terms of the president knew that what he wanted to tell James Comey was not legal. That's why he asked these people to leave. He didn't want any witnesses. Again, there's some you know, opinion here, but it is sort of, to me, the pieces how they fit, is that he asked everybody to leave so that there would be no witnesses to what he was about to ask because he didn't want witnesses because he knew he shouldn't be asking them because he knew it was wrong. And then he did, went ahead and said, you know, you know, it'd be great if you find it in, you know, to dropping this investigation. Now, the, this person is the uh, national security advisor who had come earlier, uh, who had in the past lied to the FBI when the FBI came to the White House and uh, talked to him and they knew he lied. And at that time, Deputy Director Sally Yates came back to the White House and told the White House, you know what, Michael Flynn is lying and he's lying to the FBI, so he's committed a crime. Because he was having several meetings with the Russians. With the Russians. And the Russians were obviously, and not only the Russians, he was receiving money from individuals and he was trying to manipulate his position into an advantageous, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of it, basically, is what he was doing. And the president didn't fire him right away when he knew that. He kept him. And then he tried to drop the investigation, knowing that he had lied to the FBI. So that, this is why the president, when he says drop this investigation, you have to ask yourself, does he want to drop because he really wants to help Michael Flynn? Or is he concerned that what he was doing was illegal by keeping him there and that he could be in trouble because he knew he had lied and he continued to have access to secret information when they knew that he had been in touch with Russians and that they could have been manipulating him or blackmailing him and he continued as national security advisor. James Comey has been asked if he believes that President Trump has committed obstruction of justice. And he says it's possible. After that incident, it wouldn't be enough proof that he did? I think after he fired him and he, <clears throat> well, it's difficult because obstruction of justice requires that you know that what you're doing it's illegal. You're doing something <coughs> illegal and you want to hide things. You want to do it because you know that this is going to hurt you and you want to get out of it. So it, it's not easy to prove what's in somebody's brain at the time you go to court unless they talk to you. And the president is trying to avoid talking to the investigators for that reason. Now, when he asked Mike Pence and he asked uh, Jeff Sessions and other people to leave the room, that's the best evidence that the president wanted to have no witnesses and wanted to ask him to do something. And, and if that were the only thing that Mueller had to investigate, that wouldn't be enough. I think the obstruction happens when he fires Comey and Comey is fired because he refuses to go along with the president's recommendation to drop the investigation with Michael Flynn. And then the president astutely got a copy of a memo from Rosenstein, who is acting as the deputy a, a prosecutor in charge of this investigation and then gets this memo from him to say that, that Comey should be fired because he did a bad job with the Hillary Clinton emails. Um, and that would have been very difficult to case for her. But the, unfortunately for the president, the following day when he spoke to NBC News, to Lester Holt, he was asked, why did you fire Comey? And he said, because of the Russia thing. That's what makes it obstruction of justice. And I'm surprised that 
I know that the director, Director Comey, doesn't want to say that there is obstruction because he obviously is a witness in the investigation. It would not be appropriate for him to say it. Uh, but that's what it is. That is obstruction of justice. When you fire someone because they don't do what, what you tell them to do to protect your own uh, the legal consequences. The investigation is headed by the special counsel, uh, Robert Mueller. And Comey has said, and I quote, if Trump ever tries to fire the special counsel, Robert Mueller, then it would be the president's more serious attack yet to the rule of law. He says that because of what happened in this country with Richard Nixon. He says that because the president has contemplated, if not asked, his attorneys to fire Robert Mueller, which he did in December of 2017. And it was not something that his lawyer refused to do. The problem is the Congress. It's not the president. If the president fires the deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, and ultimately fires Mueller, the president has the authority to do that. Legally, he can. However, he doesn't have the authority to do that if he's doing it to protect himself from being discovered that he committed crimes or that he had collusion with the Russians. So the president is taking the risk that if he fires Mueller, that the members of Congress, and all they need is 51 percent, would find that those actions are just too much, and it looks like the president is hiding because this isn't looked at in terms of one event. You have to look at everything. The president doesn't criticize Vladimir Putin. The president doesn't impose sanctions against Vladimir Putin. The president doesn't want to sign a law imposing sanctions. And when he signed it, he never imposed the sanctions until he was forced to do it on the very last day. So many people ask, why is the president so nice to Russia? Do they have something against them that they're using to manipulate or blackmail him. And Comey has a suspicion that he does. I believe that he has a reasonable suspicion, that he probably is correct, that the president is not a coincidence when you look at all the pieces of the puzzle, that the president has been protecting Russia, doesn't want to do anything, doesn't want to release his taxes, doesn't want his financial information. And Mueller has one of the lead attorneys working in his team, is a former investigator of mafia activity in another one of financial crime, which is another thing they're suspecting, that the president or his company or people that he's associated with could have been receiving funds from Russians, oligarchs, to uh, use in the campaign. That would be a, a, an illegal act. On the other hand, how do you interpret that the Congress, that there was an initiative at least to make sure that uh, President Trump cannot fire Robert Mueller uh, that initiative didn't uh, succeed? I don't think that would succeed with a, a majority Republican in Congress. The Republicans do not want to leave the image or give the impression, if you will, that they don't trust their leader because the president is the uh, leader of the Republican Party. He's the president. And they don't want that. I think uh, uh, the, the president of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, uh, announced that he wasn't going to present any legislation on that. He trusts that the president is not going to do anything. Uh, people buy insurance in their car hoping they'll never have an accident, but they know that they could. So that's what the Speaker of the, House, of the Senate is doing. He's not buying insurance. He's not saying, let's pass this legislation to prevent them from passing it because of the image. And I think that could be a mistake. Now, it doesn't mean that Congress doesn't have the authority. It wouldn't be the Senate. It would be the House. They would have the authority to impeach the president if he were to fire Mueller with or without legislation. But I think the legislation would have had to be signed by the president if he vetoed the legislation. It goes back and then it would have to attain a super majority in order to pass uh, the veto. In the last few days, uh, President Trump has hired former New York City mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, and who was a prosecutor, and you, as you mentioned, he was prosecuting the mafia trying to reinforce his legal team in order to defend himself in a better way. And now the latest was that he could be trying again uh, to coordinate a meeting or an interview by Mueller of President Trump. What what's, could be the strategy? They are, don't want to speak to the, you know, to the investigator. Trump, President Trump does not want to give a statement because he has difficulty telling the truth. And when you don't tell the truth, when you're being interviewed by the FBI, 
it's a crime and people can go to jail. It's a thousand and one is the code section that says you get five years in jail for that. So the president is trying to avoid talking. He brings Rudy Giuliani, who obviously knew Mueller, they worked together. He trained James Comey. Uh, so they know each other and he announced that he was going to fix everything. But he has to talk to uh, Mueller by being willing to cooperate and give this interview. He's going to try to limit the scope of the interview. He's going to try to say, we're not going to talk about this, we're going to talk about that. But Mueller holds the final word because he has the authority to issue a subpoena against the president and force him to testify in front of a grand jury in Washington, D.C., where his lawyer could not be present to help him. So and he would be under oath. And the nation could see his testimony. And this could have dire consequences. So if Rudy Giuliani wants to be the hero, he needs to get his client to speak to Mueller. And his client needs to be truthful in this interview, or else Ju Rudy Giuliani is not going to be able to help him. You think it's going to happen? I, I hope so. I think it would help uh, to get closure and to at least uh, give completion to this investigation. I think if he never testifies, the president will always say, well, they, you know, I, I, I couldn't talk to them because they wanted to, you know, trick me. There is no trick. The questions would be simple. The problem is that we have heard different answers at different times from the same president on some of these questions. Comey says also in his book that uh, Trump's presidency looks like a forest fire that can be contained. I would have a difficult time disagreeing with that. I think he's right. Every day, we, especially us who live in the Washington, D.C. area, experience a lot of uh, tension, a lot of surprises, a lot of instability. And we've never felt that before, not to this degree. And clearly, uh, President Trump um, is someone who is controversial in how he does things. Um, his way of dealing with the media, Twitter, uh, it creates a lot of attention. And I think that uh, the White House has been a place of tradition, of duty, of honor, of service to the people. And while you may disagree with some uh, ideology of one president versus the other, I think all Bush presidents, Clinton uh, and Obama, have been distinguished individuals who served the country the way that George Washington intended. Um, not this president. Twitter, having movie stars inside the White House, giving his job to his personal, giving a job to his personal friends every time he can, uh, has failed in every way. And it creates a lot of instability. And I'm pretty sure that the image out in the rest of the world is not a good one. The New York Times has said that uh, Trump confidence, see Michael Cohen, his personal, Trump's personal lawyer, sees uh, Michael Cohen's investigation as a bigger threat than the Russiagate investigation. I think Russiagate is different in the sense that a lot of other people were involved and I am sure they were much more careful in the appearances, transactions and things of that nature, although some people have already pled guilty like George Papadopoulos and other ones. Now with regard to this other case with Cohen it has to do with Mr. Fixer, the person who fixes the president's problems. The mafia uses that too. They call it a consigliere, which is your counselor, but in the mafia. And the consigliere doesn't work for anybody else, just works for the boss. And the consigliere will do anything the boss needs, whether it's legal or not. And that's sort of the image that Cohen has been giving by only having one or two clients and the type of work he's done for these clients of giving money to uh, a porn star, and a former Playboy model uh, to be silent about affairs that they had with the president uh, right before the campaign and then lying to them about how they were going to be famous and they're going to sell their stories. This sort of transactional thing is so bad that the president is at much higher risk that whatever Cohen did is going to stick to him because Cohen was doing it for his boss. He wasn't doing it for his own interest. And the president is trying to distance himself. When Air Force One said, I didn't know anything about Stormy Daniels and the money. Well, we're finding uh, out. Ask Cohen, he said. Yeah, ask Cohen. And I'm, well, why ask Cohen if Cohen is not representing you? If, if Cohen is representing him, whatever Cohen does, it, it is legally binding on his client because he's doing it on behalf of his client. He's not doing it out of his own free will. 
he was trying to get around it, but the problem is that if he did it on his own, he violated election laws by donating the equivalent of $130,000 on one, $150,000 on another woman against election laws that limit how much money you can donate to a candidate. In the case of Stormy Daniels, the porno star that uh, he, she has been paid $130,000 a few days before the election to silence her. She said that she had sex with uh, Donald Trump in uh, 2006, and she was suing. She is suing Michael Cohen. He has decided to plea the Fifth Amendment. What is he reading about that? It, well, I think that says a lot. Uh, somebody in a criminal case who uses the Fifth Amendment, your right to remain silent and not to incriminate yourself, um, is normal. It's done all the time. Most lawyers will ask their clients or recommend to their clients not to testify. However, the people who judge that person, the jury, never hears that. The jury never hears that the person elected not to testify. They cannot use that against them. The judge tells them, if somebody doesn't testify, you're not to assume that they're guilty. Now, in a civil case, which is what this is, it, that's not the same. It's very different. In a civil case, if Cohen maintains his silence based on the fact that it could incriminate him, the jury will hear that. It will be done in front of the jury. And the jury and the lawyer could, could tell the jury and the judge will give them an instruction that they can assume that the answer that was going to come out of Mr. Cohen's mouth was not going to be a positive answer. It was going to be a negative answer, meaning that it would be something that would hurt Mr. Cohen. So I think it would be impossible for Mr. Cohen to win the case if he has to remain silent in the case. If uh, Stormy Daniels wins the case, then the information about this relationship and there's pictures and videos potentially uh, of Mr. Trump or, or together, emails, at least her attorney has indicated that there a lot, there's a lot that they would share with the nation. And that could be a big blow against the president, especially uh, the Republicans out in, uh, now. You and I live here in Washington, and uh, it's a very special town. Oh, yes. And uh, there was uh, a voice circulating that uh, Michael Cohen could make a deal with the justice in order to avoid to be sentenced and telling the investigation, everything that he knows about his relationship with uh, Donald Trump. What do you think about that uh, voices flying on the air? I, I believe that that's a, a, a voice that may be right. Um, I think that every person has a limit. Uh, Michael Cohen, if we look at him, he made a lot of money in real estate and also owning a taxi cab business. Um, and so he really didn't need the president to make a living. He was buying real estate investments. He was doing well married, has children, um, and because of the different transactions that we're talking about and because of the amount of money that they involved under federal law, he could be facing very high sentences, very, very stiff sentences. Many years? 20 years, 30 years, could be life uh, at his age, and consequently, someone who's looking at a federal prison, that's the most difficult prison time to serve, and, and you have to serve 85% minimum or, or 100%. So if he gets 30 years, he may not see his children grow up. He's not going to be able to, his wife may have to, you know, redo her, or it could ruin him. I'm not really sure that at that point, Michael Cohen is going to be loyal to the president and remain silent just to help him. And if the president is trying to say, remain silent, I'm going to give you a pardon. The president doesn't know that by giving Michael Cohen a pardon, that now Michael Cohen cannot take the Fifth Amendment because he can no longer incriminate himself because the crime has been wiped out. So now he's a witness that has to testify against the president. That's why Michael Cohen cannot trust that the president is going to pardon him and that everything is going to go away. Because the moment that happens, Michael Cohen can no longer plead the fifth and he has to testify and involve other people. As a lawyer, what is what you are paying more attention regarding all the legal battles of Trump and how you think it's going to end up? Finances. I think that finances are going to be the president's biggest problem. He continues to have conflicts with his businesses, continues to advertise Mar-a-Lago. Everybody knows what Mar-a-Lago is now. They didn't know that before. And people have now are paying twice as much money for membership in that club than they were before the president got elected. That's all been done with a conflict of interest. 
also the transactions and the money that the documents they're going to find with Michael Cohen. I think Michael Cohen wanted to build a tower in, in Moscow. So though that could be a problem also. So money, we got to watch for the money because I think that there might be some transactions that automatically would be a crime and that there won't be any way to get out. Joseph Malouf, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me.